everybody. Thanks for joining us. Sorry we're a little late. I'm Sarah. I'm Caroline. And uh, we run admissions here at GA. Um, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, we're going to be monitoring the chat, so feel free to start sending in your questions. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to give a quick rundown of what we'll be doing. Um, we, uh, we know that the course launched today, um, but we're still accepting some applications since we're doing the info session now, obviously. Um, so we're going to put the self-enroll link in the chat box in a few minutes. Um, so uh, if you wanted to get started right away, you can do that. Um, but before uh, we get into your questions, we're going to play a few videos. One is just um, some general information about the course. The next is a sample tutorial on HTML and CSS. And when we get back, we're going to answer your questions. And we also have an announcement for our next uh, September 30th launch of uh, web design. So uh, we're going to play those videos now, and uh, we'll monitor the chat and talk to you soon. Today, we're going to talk about the fundamental building blocks of websites, HTML and CSS. Some of you who may be thinking you're about getting into this field may not have a background in this, or maybe you do and want to have it explained from the beginning. Well, you've come to the right place, and let me explain what we're going to cover in this video. I'll start with a quick biography of myself, and we'll learn about what HTML and CSS is. We'll talk about the different types of HTML elements. We'll do a case study with IDs and classes, an order list and unordered lists. Finally, we'll finish up with divs and spans. So my name is Pat. I'm a front-end development instructor here at General Assembly. I also work on the admissions team for the online circuits platform. I started off as a student and loved it so much that I went on to become an instructor, and I've never looked back since. As for what is General Assembly, well, we started in 2011 as an innovative company in New York City for entrepreneurs and startups. At General Assembly, we believe that you can build powerful messages using simple code. We have many different kinds of students in this course, but the one thing they have in common is they all want to use HTML and CSS to communicate their ideas to others. We started General Assembly as a place where people could learn the basic skills to feel a sense of opportunity with their next steps. Now, just a little warning. There are going to be things here you may or may not understand, and that's OK. If you're brand new to code, you've come to the right place. This video is for you, and if things fly over your head, don't worry about it. Some of this will make sense in explanation, but it's very common to have the concepts make more sense once you see an explanation. And if that doesn't do it, seeing it over and over will. Web design is a journey, and even most experienced developers will tell you their craft makes more sense every day, even at their level. Now, let's get started with the basics of web design. We'll start with some brief explanations. HTML. It stands for Hypertext Markup Language, commonly referred to as HTML. It's the standard code used to create web pages. Web browsers can read HTML files and render this to visible and audible pages. Think of this as the framework of your page. HTML tags typically surround text, which allows browsers to see when a specific type of content starts and ends. The ending tag always has a forward slash to let the browser know this is the closing tag. Now for CSS, CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. Originally, it was used to format single-paged academics' papers. CSS can seem to be a logical pairing for, to format HTML, but once you get used to the formatting, you won't ever look back. Note that the word CSS and CSS matches the HTML element. This is called a CSS selector, as it refers back to the HTML element it selects for the rules that follow. Similar to HTML, CSS has a beginning and ending tag, in this case brackets, but the notification that the rule is over is noted by the semicolon in the rules defined property. Typically, you will also see CSS written with a particular spacing and indentation, and this is for ease of reading. Let's jump over to a quick example in the meantime. Here, I have two buttons. Both are exactly the same, style of HTML. What I'm going to do now is apply some CSS to this. To do this, I'm going to target the actual element itself, button. I'm going to use those open parentheses, those open brackets. And I'm going to give this a background color of blue. You'll quickly see that the two elements are blue. This is a little small, so let's increase the font size. Let's give it 40 pixels. 
That should be good. Yep, nice and big. And I'm going to change the font color. CSS can be a little wonky like this. Instead of font color, as you might expect, it's actually just color. It's hideous, uh, but it does get the message across. What we're using here is we're using the element selector and then defining the rules within CSS. Again, each of these rules are ending by the semicolons. That's going to be necessary in CSS. Pretty straightforward. You'll quickly see what I mean when I say that there's a little bit of a problem here. Let's go back to our deck. For every HTML element, you can have something called an attribute, which helps CSS to determine which element you're targeting. For example, if you have two identical buttons like we just saw in the example and you want them to look different, what are you going to do? Well, this is where IDs can come in. By giving one of your elements an ID attribute, you can then specify which element you're talking about. Here we use the ID primary button, which will only target the first button instead of both like we did with the button selector. This is all well and fine, but what if you want to style both elements and you don't want to use the HTML element? Well, generally speaking, it's good practice to have all elements that you want to style with a definitive attribute. However, IDs can only be used once in HTML. This is where classes can come in. When we add classes to HTML elements, the CSS we write specifying the attribute will apply to all classes. Whereas before with IDs, the only elements with the ID will be given to those styles. Now with classes, all elements with the same class will look alike. Let's jump back and see how that works in examples. So for this one, I'm just going to have the class apply, the ID apply to the first element. I'm going to give it that primary button ID. Okay. Nothing happened because there is no rule for this. So what I'll do is I'll jump down and give this button here the primary button. You have to do a hashtag to symbolize this is exactly an ID. Similar notation. We'll give this a background color of cyan. Okay, so you'll notice that both of these are being targeted differently, and it's only by the, the difference in the selector itself. Again, what if we copy this down? We want the remaining classes to be something else entirely. We could use the button, but unfortunately, that's going to target all of the buttons, but I only want to affect these last three. So I'm going to give them all a class. Give it second. Doesn't actually matter what you name it, as long as they're consistent. Okay. Now, let's say for a class, you have to use a period instead of a hashtag, as we saw in the beginning. Okay. I'm going to give this a background color of wheat. Okay, and we'll change the text to cyan. Okay, absolutely hideous. But the point I'm trying to make is that you can use attributes here to define your HTML elements. Now, let's do those case studies here. Let's do a list item, and we'll do some spans and some divs. We'll start with UL, which stands for unordered list. Oh, it gives us a lot of good text there. Okay. So the list item here, and what I want to do is I want to style the list items themselves. I could do LI and tell them that I need their font to be larger. But remember, we want to use best practice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give each of my list items a specific class here. I'm going to copy this so I have to retype it. These attributes, as you notice, go in the first tag, not the closing tag. Give this...
have to add the period. Now we're targeting the classes. Okay. Now let's move on to divs and spans. Divs stand for division, and they are almost identical to spans, and we'll see when we style these out what precisely is different about them. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give my div here that didn't close my semicolon and give my span Actually, I'm going to leave that black. Okay. Going back up, I'm going to give this, for best practice, a class. Okay. I'm going to have to give these guys... Okay, almost there. Okay, what you'll notice here is that what we're seeing specifically is the div seems to take up the entire section, whereas the span doesn't. Uh, and even though they do pre almost precisely the same thing, this gets into a bit of a trickier topic with HTML and CSS, which we'll get into in just a moment. But what I want you to focus on is that the div is taking up the height of the content itself and spanning out all the way to the right, whereas the span itself is actually only staying within the content itself. This is something that's known as inline versus block. Let's jump over back to our presentation. Okay, block versus inline. So not all HTML elements are born the same. Some, when written, have implications for the document like we saw with the span and div tags. And this can get confusing as it's a subject that uh, comes into how HTML and CSS work because it seems like they have pre-built styles without ever writing any CSS. Some are block level elements, meaning that they take up the entire row in which they fill, like the div, whereas some are inline level elements, which only take up the amount of space for the content with which they contain. Does that sound confusing? Well, don't worry, it is. Why do some elements have natural style implications and, and others don't? Well, if you're just starting out, this can be a very confusing point when you're learning. But the designers of HTML wanted a way for the elements to be more flexible while others are more rigid. The flexibility of the language is important because they didn't want to constrain how web pages should look. But for us at this point, and especially if you're new to web design, it can just seem confusing. So I can assure you that the more you work with HTML and CSS, the more sense it will make. To that end, sometimes you'll want to have an element take up the whole page without having to write a rule to do that, and others you won't. So the reason for this is that the less code you write to accomplish a goal, the better and the faster your code will be. Let's talk about web design circuit. The course is composed of two sections front-end web development, and visual design. You'll learn how to design beautiful and responsive websites in 12 weeks. On the front-end side, there's how the web works, HTML, CSS, page structure, navigation, grid systems, and coded emails. On the visual design side, there's principles of web design, color theory, typography, design critique, fluid design, and mobile design. The course is broken up into 10 units, and during each of those units, you'll have unit projects. There are two big sections for the mid-course project and the final project, the final project being your own choice. 
Every week, you'll have weekly live lectures, and each of those will be at a specified time set by your mentor. But don't worry if you can't make it. Each of those will be hosted onto the website for you to download later. You'll also have the support team of your online course producer and your web design mentor to cheer you on the whole way. A typical week breakdown is going to be different for every person because you have different life circumstances. But for most of you, on Monday, you're going to view all the content of the unit. On Tuesday, you'll watch a mentor live lecture. On Wednesday and Thursday, you'll plan your project and spend time building your project. On Saturday, you'll submit your project and get your one-on-one -on -one feedback with your mentor on a session on probably Sunday. You should dedicate about eight to 10 hours per week to be successful in this course. You will have check-ins with your web design mentor each week to keep you on track and motivated. Your mentor is also available over the weekend and will respond within 24 hours. When it comes to the content, it's interactive, videos and quizzes. The short videos are narrated by web design experts who will walk you through the key concepts and the quizzes will assess your knowledge and help you see how you're performing relative to your classmates. When it comes to the code challenges and review guides, it allows you to practice what you learn by writing actual code and getting dynamic feedback. What you code on one side will actually appear on the other side. And the review guides sum up everything for you so you're ready to work on your projects. The class projects are special. They put together everything that you've learned up until that point. The unit projects help you make each lesson and practice the skills you discussed. And your mid-course and final projects are your very own ideas built from scratch. Projects are then submitted to your mentor who will provide feedback and answer your questions. Tuition for the course is 1,600 and we have flexible payment plans available. All you need to do to secure your seat is a deposit of $250 and don't worry, your course producer is always there if things change. To apply, go to ga.co slash webdesign, fill out an application, and we'll do the rest. Um, we're here to answer your questions about the web design course, um, so feel free to send those in. Um, you know, also, uh, Caroline and I both run admissions here, so we get a lot of questions on a day-to-day -day basis. So, um, you know, we'll go over some frequently asked questions and also take yours as they come. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. So, uh, we actually did have one uh, question come in. The question is, what time is the lecture? are the lectures usually? So, uh, we do, uh, it does vary from, from cohort to cohort. Uh, for the first half of the, of the uh, course, the, the live lecture is held twice a day. So, it's held at noon as well as 7 p.m. So, if you're not able to catch one of them uh, or both, you can always catch the live recording. Um, those are typically Tuesdays or Thursdays, but again, it varies from cohort to cohort. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's typically when the lectures are. Awesome. All right, uh, what else? Um, we have another one. Um, what is the time commitment for this course? Yeah, great question. So the web design course is about an eight hour per week time commitment. What that looks like is a one hour live lecture that's a live stream, and like Caroline was saying, um, you know, we have a few time options for that. Um, also, we record and send it to you if you miss it. So we understand we have a lot of international students um, or also just busy students. So if you can't make it for whatever reason, we made the course as flexible as possible, and you can watch it on your own time. So that's one hour of the eight. Then there is a one-on-one -on -one, um, for 30 minutes with a mentor, and uh, you sign up for that at a time that's best for you. Then the remaining approximately six to six and a half hours is spent on your weekly assignments. And um, you know you can work on those at your own pace. So like I said before, we built the course to be um, you know, good for people who are working full time or you know are just really busy. Maybe they uh, have a family and they're working. And um, yeah, so we just want it to be uh, something that you can do at your own pace. The one caveat I would add to that though is that um, you know the way that the course is structured is each lesson builds on each other. So, um, you know, from week to week, you should be completing the assignments. Um, and, you know, that sounds a little rigid, but here's the reason why we do that is because, you know, I find in a lot of online courses, um, not at GA, the completion rate is really low. And something that's a priority to us is for you to finish and to finish well. And so, um, you know, we want to hold you accountable to completing your work each week. Um, and if for whatever reason you can't do it that week, we're also willing to work with you to um, build a catch-up plan or, you know, to uh, get ahead if, you know, you have a trip coming up. So uh, we'll try and make it flexible, but we just want to make sure that you're, you know, finishing the coursework and uh, staying on track. 
Great, thanks, Sarah. So we have one other question. How many people start with this cohort? Uh, do I get to interact with them? Uh, really, the cohort depends. Um, sometimes we have 35 students, sometimes we have 55. It just totally depends on um, the group of, of students that we have, but you absolutely will be able to uh, interact with them. Uh, during your live lecture, we encourage student participation. So uh, even though it is 100% online, uh, there's a significant human element to it. We encourage uh, raising your hand, interrupting, asking questions. Uh, so it does have a classroom type feel, even though it is all online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to add to that too, um, there's also a, a chat that you join and you'll be able to meet, you know, your fellow students. So um, I see Alexandra had asked about LinkedIn and uh, yeah, that's exactly the kind of opportunities we want to provide. Um, at General Assembly, like we're all about community. That's one of our top virtues um, of the company. And so we want to make sure that our online students feel as much a part of that community as our campus students. And so yeah, we try and connect you guys with each other. And if you're near campus too, um, you know, you'll also be invited to campus events, things like that. Um, and so we want to make it, you know, networking friendly as well um, and really have that communal aspect to encourage each other um, and, uh, yeah, just kind of do the course together. Great. Uh, yeah. So we have another question here. Do you, see, do you use live stream for live lectures as well? So we have our own uh, student portal through GA that once you sign up for the course, mm -hmm. you'll receive a welcome packet uh, that will give you uh, detailed instructions as to how to log on. Um, and then a, a good question that really segues into our next uh, portion of the, the info session. Uh, someone asked, if I can't sign up for this session, when will the next session start? Sarah, do you want to tackle that question? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, great question coming from the audience. Uh, if you missed the intro, um, we talked about a little bit. We know we have a course that launched today, September 16th. If you are interested in signing up for that, we did include a self-enroll link in the chat. Um, we'll include that again for those of you who want to sign up. Um, but we also have a course that's coming up on September 30th. And, uh, you know, an announcement that we have about that is that um, this uh, September 16th start date will be the last of the 12-week um, uh, courses, and we're going to switch to a 10-week a little more boot camp style course and um, we're just going to be condensing a few of the weeks together so if you wanted to do um, you know more visual design then the um, current 12-week format that starts today um, would be a good choice for you and then in the future we're going to be um, you know kind of combining some of the visual design um, aspects together and uh, you know making a 10-week course at a slightly lower price point at uh, 1250 instead of 1600 Wonderful. So um, that concludes some all of the live questions uh, that yeah, we've do, got. Uh, we're going to keep answering some questions, so feel free to send those in. Um, we're going to just uh, go through some frequently asked questions, but uh, yeah, we'll keep an eye on it on the chat. So another question that we typically get, um, are there any prerequisites for a class like this? And this class was designed for a beginner and intermediate students. So uh, there are no prereqs. Um, if you have had no experience coding uh, or any experience with web design, you'll be you'll be good to go. Um, again, uh, the, the time commitment for this class typically about eight to ten hours, but it really varies uh, between students. Uh, so we're getting a little bit of. Um, our live stream was frozen for a second, so sorry. Bear with us. Yeah, yeah. I think we're back. Um, yeah, so uh, feel free to send in questions if uh, for whatever reason you couldn't hear us or we missed it. Um, but uh, like I said before, Carolyn and I are going to be going through some frequently asked questions that we get as admissions officers. Um, and uh, yeah, so feel free to uh, you know send those in and we'll try as best as we can to, to answer them. So uh, we have another question. Uh, do you get to pick your mentors? So uh, you don't get to pick your mentor. We have a number of mentors working throughout the course. And all of our mentors are phenomenal. They're all industry professionals, have years of experience, um, such an asset to our team. So regardless of the mentor that you work with, you know that uh, you'll be in good hands. Um, and it really just depends on what your schedule looks like and other mentors as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, something else that uh, I haven't seen anybody put in the chat, but uh, is just good information to know, is that for all of our online courses, we do have payment plans. And um, what that looks like is before the course starts, you put down a $250 deposit, 
and then uh, we can break up the payment into as uh, many smaller pieces as you want as long as you're done paying by the uh, after the duration of the course. So, um, you know, I know Caroline and I have both worked with people in all types of situations. And, uh, you know, if there's a will, there's a way in this case. Um, you know, we're really happy to hear you out, um, to help you as much as we can uh, with breaking up the, the payments. And also, like I said, the, um, the course that launches on the 30th uh, will be at uh, $12.50. And so uh, there will be a slight uh, drop in the price. Um, so if that has been a barrier for you, um, hopefully in the future, you know, that'll be something that um, is a little more manageable. Great. So uh, one last question mm -hmm. uh, from one of our international students. I'm based in Australia. Will my mentor be from Australia also? Um, unfortunately, your mentor will not be Australian. We're uh, based out of our, our New York office, um, so they will be American, but we have a number of international students, and actually our international students are, are growing by the minute. Uh, so again, that's a nice thing about having um, that really flexible schedule with your mentor. You can really um, schedule that what's convenient for your mentor and for you. I know there's a significant time change, so uh, we can make sure to accommodate accommodate that as well. Yeah, awesome. So guys, I know we've had you know some technical errors throughout. Um, we're both going to stay on the live stream a few minutes longer just on the chat. Um, so feel free to send those questions in. We're also going to include our email address, which is onlineadmissions at ga.co. Caroline's going to put that in the, um, in the chat. Uh, feel free to email us there um, if you have more questions. And also, um, you know, uh, we'll be on a little while longer. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, we're also going to be sending a recording out tomorrow um, and so if you missed it or if it was a little glitchy for you hopefully uh, that'll fix that have a good night thanks everyone Bye.